time change in the UK. And so I, you know, was like nervously looking uh, where Bucharest is and looking up everybody's names and things like that. Um, and I saw Daniela and I saw Claudia and your beautiful environments. <laughs> So um, I've never seen you in your beautiful environments except here. Okay, um, I want you to tell. And we can begin maybe. You tell me when I should start, please. Daniel. Mm. Oh, we are live on your stream. Why don't we begin, why don't we begin right yeah. now? We can begin now. Um, good. We're going, we're going to begin this session. And um, this session is um, about uh, representation of wonder. And um, let me turn over the, um, the chair now to uh, Stephanie Kerner, who will be the moderator for our session today. Stephanie. Thanks so much. Um, now, thank you very, very much for having me. And I'm going to, uh, do you see my slides? No, not yet. I'm not doing it right. I did it before, right? Now we should see our slides. Um, actually, I always leave my screen this way um, because it. Uh, if I get nervous, then I don't have to think about it. Then it sort of pushes me on. So you please allow that to just look kind of strange here. Um, first and foremost, um, the all of four of us want to thank the seminars organizers um, for all their support and then also today's participants uh, in the seminars for being here wherever you are. Um, and it's really a pleasure for me and my dear colleagues, Susanna Berger, uh, Edward Wolk and Glenn Mose to present our very much work in progress, picturing wonder and rendering the counterintuitive in early modern philosophy visible. Um, you'll find in your um, in the seminar announcement a summary of the sorts of issues that we're trying to address, and these do link our very different presentations to one another. Thus, to start off, I will only illustrate key points with some pictures, and you're already seeing the barrage coming at you um, with picturing wonder, the counterintuitive in ancient Greek culture, in Dante, in Giotto, in Leonardo da Vinci, Galileo, Descartes, and then I'm going to say something just toward the end about sequencing and timing so that you can know when you can then start to ask questions. We're on this slide now. Um, oh, yes, exactly. Uh, today there's a widespread agreement that new insights of early modern science and philosophy can help address really long outstanding problems in the historical study of art. For example, uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, the philosopher of art, John Hyman, stresses the problems that mainstream traditions have posed by treating pictorial representation as forced to choose between two vexed options that are variously derived from Plato. In one view, a picture represents an object by copying its, its external appearance, but not its internal structures. In the other view, the so-called illusionist view is preoccupied with the impacts pictures have, especially on people susceptible to irrationality, superstition, and idolatry. It's difficult to overstate the value that has been thrown on such problems by remarkable efforts to rethink the histories of science and philosophy. And in the present context, I probably think it's worth mentioning the exemplary nature of Lorraine Daston's work, which she calls historical epistemology or applied metaphysics. But in my sense, I think we may risk one directional cross-disciplinary exchange if we do not attend to the possibility that new insights of the history of art can help address issues raised but have not been addressed directly, even by some of the most sophisticated work that is rethinking what is meant by scientific illustration. Our seminar focuses on innovations in picturing the counterintuitive, the more than meets the eye. 
the term here I have um, from Mitchell, the, and he points out, the world of image making is as much concerned with the invisible as the visible. This may seem paradoxical if we remind ourselves that painters have always claimed to present us with more than meets the eye. At first, so let's, let me show this a picture of this. This is the picture I want to focus on, okay? Let me show a, lo lo a lovely picture of the dream of Constantine. Now, at first glance, we might not find this particularly strange. And this is really a something that a, 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 a credit here goes to Martin Kemp, his new book on um, vision and the divine. He looks at this wonderful picture and he says, isn't this ever strange? It's as though a, 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 a sort of a light, is, an electrical light is being sh shown on this thing, even though obviously at this time, there, it would have been entirely impossible to have the kind of electrical equipment that you would need to film movies in the middle of the night. It becomes much more strange then when we take a look at this odd angel um, who is from whom this um, light is actually emanating. And indeed, it's actually hard to see this angel. She's so, he or she is anamorphically, to use Susanna's term, foreshortened. Importantly, no one sees the angel but us once we've made him out, okay, and Constantine in his dream, who we assume knows is there, the, the angel. The painting is saying something about light that exceeds ordinary vision, that is counterintuitive to how light works in everyday experience. Light that behaves this way must probably, in period terms, be miraculous. This helps to introduce the seminar's organizing question. What were the roots of the emphasis that such iconic figures in mainstream accounts of early modern science place on the indispensable roles of picturing in discovering and demonstrating the plausibility of seemingly counterintuitive things and processes? Now we're down to our pictures. Picture, picture, excellent. He, he, okay. Okay, um, can we compare aspects of this emphasis with ancient Greek notions of wonder and or visible speech in the 13th century? For example, Dante's Divine Comedy. I want to have this beautiful picture here of Iris, who is the daughter of wonder, actually. Um, and, and does this compare then with later innovations in picturing the more than meets the eye, variously influenced by who were influenced by these renowned poets and artists. In this seminar, we present diverse examples that broach this question from the perspective offered by our working hypothesis, or at least mine, I've sort of dragged everybody in here, I apologize, namely that many innovations in picture and counterintuitive wonderness, and of course, as the angel tells us unsettling things, frightening things, may compare with what is meant by wonder in ancient epic poetry and philosophy, as will hopefully described by Glenn Most. And with also with Dante, what Dante called visible speech, I'm a big fan of this now, and his praise of uh, Pisano's Pisa Cathedral, as well as Giotto's Arena uh, Chapel Muros. And Dante goes on and on about this. I can't talk about it here. So here's Dante pictures. There's his um, optics. Here, often he's referring to artists. If we don't know what the, 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 the sacred realm here is looking like, he'll go, oh, yes, I remember what it looked like. I was in Pisa and I saw the fantastic sculptures made by Pisano. Oh, now I'm approaching the high heavens of paradise. I can't see anything. Oh, I remember. Yes, yes, I saw this before. It was in Giotto's chapel. I saw there that the angel was peeling back the heavens. A critical point of departure for this um, grouping here is definitely Martin Kemp's book on, um, on, on uh, the science of art. 
In his chapter on perspective from Albert Durer to Galileo, he brings together two excellent observations. On the one hand, Kemp stresses that during Galileo's times, innovations in the production and application of pictorial realist techniques may have been exceeded by those in art, may have been exceeded by those taking place in astronomy, geography, engineering, and philosophical practices. On the other hand, Kemp makes this wonderful observation, the evidence of the period indicates that it was only when painters' techniques had been fully absorbed into the different functional contexts and different methodologies that they became essential to these fields' development. Now, what does he mean here? Put in the tombs we're using, I sort of translate it, it may not have been until early Malian scientists and so on had absorbed the wider relevance of possibilities by picturing practices of the more than meets the eye, that they developed their own ways of using pictures to investigate things that exceed the ordinary perception. And this is the Galileo stuff that exceed, here's Galicini, exceed ordinary observations, including also uh, Descartes' uh, mechanical philosophy. I think I'm done with my pictures. There we go on to um, further examples um, that would be indicative of the kind of uh, ideas that would have been absorbed by those uh, people like Galileo and later people. So this brings me to talk about our timing. Um, we have organized ourselves, not at all, but roughly in chronological sequence from the earliest to the most recent. The diversity of our group is so great that we need to have questions and discussions in a sort of systematic way. So the, rep the presentations are going to be around 20 minutes and we can have about five or seven minutes intervals for questions about particulars, which should leave us with 45 minutes to invite questions and discussion that underscores what that our, we are doing work in progress. I thank you very much. I will stop my screen share. And next I will turn over my um, responsibilities to my dear colleague, Glenn Most, who has brought, bringing us slides. Um, thank you, Stephanie. But let me ask whether there are any people who want to ask questions of Stephanie's introduction before I begin with my own presentation. If not, then I will um, start to share my screen. Um, and um, is that working? Okay, um, and then I will begin. In early Greek epic, words of the family Thalma, Thalmazo, Thamastos, occur fairly often to denote a specific variety of joyous, overwhelmed surprise. Though the etymology is not entirely certain, these words seem most likely to be derived from theaomai, a verb that means to gaze upon, but also to contemplate, to observe. This latter verb, theaomai, is itself connected with theoros, theoria, which refer originally to the official spectator delegated to act as observer by one city at the religious ceremonies of another city, but then became generalized, faithfully for Western philosophy, to mean observation, contemplation, especially scientific or philosophical. Anagoras is said to have said that man was born in order to do theoria of the heavens. Thalma, and related terms indicate a rapturous, astonished admiration, never for an unexpected outcome or indeed for an event of any sort, but instead always for some entity, a person or an object. 
Almost always, the admiration is the result of a sensory perception. Originally, in early Greek epic, sight, though with time, this is enlarged to include hearing. In most cases, the subject that feels the, the subjects that feel the surprise are one or more human beings, and the single, indeed, the singular object that provokes it is divine in nature or origin or fabrication, or else it's monstrous. In any case, something that far transcends ordinary humanity. Very often, the noun is combined with an epexegetic infinitive denoting sight. Above all, in the epic phrase, Thalma Idesthai, a wonder to look upon, emphasizing that it is the visual impact of the astonishing object which strikes its visitors once, its, its viewers once, and then continues to affect them that causes this effect. When Homer's Thetis asks the divine craftsman Hephaestus to forge a new shield for her mortal son Achilles, he promises that he will create one such that every human being will marvel at it. As surely fair armor will be his, such that in future many a one will of the multitude of men shall marvel, Thaumasitai, whoever looks on it. And related words go on to recur a number of times in the descriptions of the individual scenes on it. And young men were whirling in the dance, and with them flutes and lyres sounded continually, and the women stood each at her doorway and marveled, now mods in. So too, and the field grew black behind and looked as if it had been um, something that was of gold. That was the great marvel, Thalma, of the work. When in Hesiod, the gods decide to fabricate Pandora as a punishment for unwitting humans, she is so irresistibly beautiful that not only the humans, but even the gods too are astonished at her. Here you see the word recurring three times, Thalma Idesthai, Thalmasia, and then Thalma Dek Achthanatis Tathis Tnatis Tantrotis. Astonishment gripped the mortal, immortal gods and the mortal humans as they saw the sheer deceit, the intractable for human beings. Thalma, Thalmasia, Thalma. These terms continue to occur frequently in Greek and lyric, in Greek lyric and dramatic poetry, and in such Greek prose authors as the, of the fifth century BCE as Herodotus. Used in the negative, by poets as different as Pindar and Aristophanes, they say it's not a marvel. They indicate that some phenomenon, which might seem strange, is in fact no cause for real astonishment, because in the end it lends itself to an easily found explanation. In this period, thalma and related words almost invariably denote the startled human recognition that there is a realm that transcends humans. This realm provokes in its mostly human observers, not consternation nor dread, but a kind of hypnotized joy. While in some passages, the astonishment may imply a certain uncanniness or intractability, there is no implication of terror ever. But by the same token, there is no cognitive component or effect to early Greek thalma. This is a wonder that stupefies and exhilarates, but it teaches nothing. So it is all the more surprising that Plato, in his aporetic dialogue about the definition of knowledge, the Theotetus, chooses to have his Socrates prominently assert an essential link between Thalma and philosophy. Socrates, and the young Theotetus have been debating Theotetus's first proposed definition of knowledge, that it is simply identical to sense perception, for example, to sight. And Socrates has had little difficulty in enwrapping his inexperienced interlocutor in inextricable swaths of objections, paradoxes, and self-contradictions. When Theotetus announces 
that perplexities like Socrates' last barrage of absurd consequences make him feel a supernatural wonder, uperfuos ver thamadzo, and even make him feel dizzy, Socrates replies, Theodorus seems to have made quite a good guess about your natural disposition. For this feeling, to feel wonder, thamadzing, belongs especially to a philosophy, for there is no other beginning of philosophy than this. And the man who said that Iris, Iris, was the child of Thaumas, created quite a good the genealogy. The genealogy asserted here derives ultimately from Hesiod's Theogony, where Thaumas is the father of Iris, the rainbow. But it is doubtless Plato himself who invents the pseudo etymological link between Thaumas and Thauma, and who attributes a philosophical significance to the Hesiodic genealogy. In Hesiod, this comes and goes, and it's gone among the hundreds and hundreds of gods, whereas Plato selects it to make a novel point about the origin of philosophy. We can easily see in phonic terms why Socrates could associate Thaumas with Thauma. But why should Iris, the rainbow, signify philosophy? Elsewhere, Plato's Socrates etymologizes the name of Iris as meaning to speak, from earring to speak, so in the cradles. And that makes at least phonic sense. But that sense seems far too general to be of much help here. To say that Iris is connected with speaking doesn't explain why she's a philosopher. Instead of looking to Iris's name, let us think instead of her function as the rainbow, the divine messenger who brings to humans the announcements of the gods. If she is the mediator communicating between gods and men, then in Platonic terms, she can be claimed to embody the activity of philosophy itself. For philosophy is the insatiable human desire, philo, for a divine wisdom, Sophia, that belongs by right to the gods and that human beings can never fully attain, so in the Apology. In the same way, Eros is a philosopher in the Symposium, for Eros too is neither a god nor a human, but instead a daimon, a being intermediate between gods and men who carries human things to the gods and divine things to men, so too in the symposium. And so Socrates can claim that he himself possesses an erotic art in the Phaedrus, or that he knows nothing about anything except for Eros, so again in the symposium. What permitted Plato to invent, for it is surely Plato who invented it, this essential link between wonder and philosophy was the privileged role he learned from Socrates to assign to Apollia in the process of philosophical disputation and instruction. Not to feel in its full intensity the perplexity provoked by a philosophical puzzle, not to feel wondering at it, is not to recognize the genuine difficulties that attend philosophical inquiry, but by the same token to remain in wondering perplexity is to remain in a state of non-philosophical ignorance. To be a philosopher for Plato is to feel dizzy, astonished by aporia, but also then to be able to move beyond momentary stupefaction in the direction of a better argument, a truer doctrine. In the Theotetus, Socrates and Theotetus will move together through three different inadequate definitions of knowledge. And when the dialogue closes, it will be not because they have finally discovered the true definition, but because Socrates has been summoned to court to answer the, the accusation that has been brought against him by Miletus. We, who are outside the dialogue, know that Socrates will be condemned at this trial and that his life will end soon after, without his or Theotetus's ever having resolved their conundrum. But we also know that this problem, what is knowledge, will remain to be investigated by those who will follow after Socrates. 
above all, Socrates' greatest pupil, Plato, and his own pupils and leaders. But Plato insists that not everyone is up to the challenge of this true philosophical wonder. At the beginning of the dialogue, Socrates goes to great lengths to ascertain from Theodorus that Theotetus does indeed have a natural aptitude for philosophy. Indeed, it turns out that Theotetus even has the very same snub nose and bulging eyes as Socrates does. So it's absolute proof that he's a born philosopher. Plato's greatest pupil, Aristotle, took up the link between wonder and philosophy that Plato had established, but in conspicuously reasserting it, he gave it a characteristic twist. In the second chapter of the first book of his, metamor of his metaphysics, Aristotle demonstrates by reference to the first philosophers that wisdom is not a practically productive science. I quote, it is through wonder, totamazin, that men now begin and original, originally began to philosophy, philosophize, wondering, thalmazantis, in the first place at obvious perplexities, and then by a gradual progression, raising questions about the greater matters too, e.g. about the changes of the moon and of the sun, about the stars and about the origin of the universe. Now, he who wonders, thalmazon, and is perplexed, feels that he is ignorant. Thus, the myth lover is in a sense a philosopher, since myths are composed of wonders, Thamazion. Therefore, if it was to escape ignorance that men studied philosophy, it is obvious that they pursued science for the sake of knowledge and not for any practical utility. End of the quotation. Aristotle retains Plato's interpretation of wonder as a dynamic impulse that pull, pulls men from ignorance of the world to awareness of their ignorance about it, to a desire for knowledge of it, to finally knowledge itself. In a first stage, we are like animals, unaware even of how little we know. Then we start to recognize that there are things we do not understand and our feeling of wonder at them, so far from remaining in a condition of mute, stupefied admiration, impels us to investigate them in the hope of understanding them better until in the end, we manage at least to a certain extent to do so. Thus wonder is not itself philosophy or knowledge or wisdom, but without wonder, we would never manage to arrive at those higher goals. But whereas Plato, and this is the crucial difference, had reserved the capacity for wonder, like the capacity for philosophy, to a tiny elite of those who by nature and training were capable of attaining it in its highest form, Aristotle broadens the range of those who can share in it. For the first philosophers, those in ancient times, but so too now as well, and even for the lovers of myth, all philosophy begins with wonder. In the words of the very first sentence of the metaphysics, a sentence that Plato could never have written, all men naturally desire knowledge. We may contrast this Greek view of the joyous wonder that leads to philosophical knowledge with another ancient tradition, one that likewise posits the recognition of human limits as the first step on the way to true wisdom, except that in this case, that recognition occurs under the sign not of joyous admiration, but of sacred terror. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. Thank you very much. Daniel, would you be so, so kind? Would you um, do the questions? I don't know how to do this as well as you do. Are you bothered if I um, do? Sure. Please. Um, you can ask questions by raising your hand or by um, indicating on the chat that you would like to uh, uh, that you would like to ask a question. I see that Daniela Yalobianu has raised her hand. I hope that I pronounced it correctly. 
Thank you. I was also writing in the chat, but then didn't see it. That's a clarificatory question, Glenn, because I kind of an outsider to the topic, but I was struck by the interesting parallel you draw between Iris and Eros in the Platonic dialogues. And um, in virtue of the fact that Iris is a sort of mediator um, and Eros is a sort of mediator, Eros is a kind of universal impulse. Isn't Iris as well a sort of universal impulse? Is it more, I mean, um, in connection with your claim that you know Plato reserved wonder to philosophers and Aristotle generalized it. If we start from this parallel between Iris and Eros, can we just move one step forward in the direction of a more general attribution of wonder as a starting point of inquiry, no matter whether you are already possessing a resemblance with Socrates or you are not? People on Zoom always forget to turn their microphones back on. Um, that's a wonderful question. Um, and many people who read Plato in antiquity asked exactly the same question and broadened the um, accessibility of humans to Eros and to wisdom far beyond what um, Plato himself would have established. This is the case, for example, in the Greek erotic romances, which are full of, of um, references to Plato. It's the case among the Neoplatonics. Plato um, has a, um, Plato was a very puzzling character. Um, and um, part of what is puzzling about him is that he felt the emotions to be um, necessary but terrifying and thought that um, all people were susceptible to them, but that very, very few were capable of um, moderating themselves and dealing with the dangers to which their emotions led them in a way that was useful. So I think that he would have thought, um, in answer to your question, yes, um, Eros and Eris are universal, and that makes life all the more difficult for human beings. And that's why it is all the more important that a few human beings who are philosophers can dominate themselves and can dominate the others and become the kings who will save mankind. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. There is a possible answer. Okay. Thank you. Um, Hanach uh, Benyami. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much uh, for a very interesting talk. Um, I wasn't familiar with uh, most of the things you mentioned uh, in uh, Homer and Hesiod and uh, the interpretation, but I'd like to ask about later uh, uh, references to wonder as the beginning of philosophy or uh, as involved in philosophy, later uh, allusions in uh, other philosophers, if there are any in antiquity. Um, thank you very much. Um, as far as I know, although um, this can be corrected um, if I'm wrong, this remains something which in, an in ancient philosophy doesn't have a big um, success. That's to say, um, you get moments, for example, in Cicero um, and in the Stoics, um, where they refer to our stupor at the beautiful organization of the universe, for example. Um, but that stupor is not directly connected to philosophy. As far as I know, it's only among later philosophers, let's say post-classical, that you have this connection made explicitly between wonder and philosophy. For example, um, in the Arabic translators and commentators on Aristotle. And then to take a completely different example, Wittgenstein, um, for whom wonder is an extremely important category um, and um, who connects it explicitly to philosophy. Um, so um, it's, uh, it goes um, beyond what I did to prepare this talk 
to look through the rest of ancient philosophy, but I will, because your question is a very interesting one. Um, my guess is that when there is a tradition of this in post-classical philosophy, it's really a reception of Aristotle's metaphysics, um, that that has had a far more important effect in post-classical philosophy than Theotetus has for Plato. But I, but I will check that. Thank you for the question. Thanks. May, may I continue with the, the finger? Please. I like uh, more. I have only a finger, not a hand. Um, uh, you mentioned Wittgenstein, and I'm interested only also in him. Um, where in Wittgenstein do you, do you find that? Can you give me some reference? Or uh... I'm sure that Stephanie can do that better than I can. Um, but um, I've run into it um, in the um, notebooks in the Philosophical Untersuchungen, um, and it seems to me something that it's certainly not in the earliest Wittgenstein, not in the Tractatus, but it becomes part of the development of his thought in the 30s. If I could, I'll just um, chirp in there. Um, I can send you, I mean, that's precisely what I'm working on now, that much of this whole um, seminar is motivated by Wittgenstein and thinking about um, Wittgenstein and Dante and there is a specialist literature that works on Wittgenstein and Dante, but they don't at attach it to art like we're trying to do. And that's the answer there. Thanks, I appreciate the reference. Thanks very much. Thank you for the questions. Um, Helen de Cruz. Hi, thank you so much. So I was really intrigued by what you were saying at the end that for Plato, it's only a tiny elite. For Aristotle, it's more people. Because, you know, the way that us non-classicists teach Plato and Aristotle is to say, look how inclusive and feminist Plato is. I know the sense. <laughs> and look how elitist that, you know, Aristotle is. And it's kind of an interesting tension because on the one hand, it, it does seem that in this particular instance, Plato is much more, uh, Aristotle is much more open to expanding the sense of wonder to all men. And by the way, is all men, all people, or is it really men? I'm sorry, I don't read ancient Greek, so I'm just wondering if you could clarify all, that. All human beings, not just all uh, males, all human beings. Okay. Um, can, let, let me say, um, your, your question is right on the money. Um, Plato um, says things about women as guardians and as philosophers in the Republic, which um, scandalized antiquity, um, which um, makes sense only as a response to Aristophanes, and which people made fun of for the rest of um, antiquity, beginning with Aristotle himself. Um, Plato sees the possibility of women being philosophers just as much as human beings, just as much as males. However, there too, it's only a tiny, tiny proportion. It's, it's only a tiny percentage of women, just like it's a tiny percentage of men. Aristotle um, seems to be so, um, um, and is explicitly um, so doubtful about the possibilities for women or for slaves to be philosophical. Um, and yet he has enormous difficulties justifying this position within his own more inclusive philosophy. This is simply um, contradictions within the thought of both of them, um, which are due to the fact that on the one hand, they're extremely smart people who are capable of following an argument to its conclusion, but are also constrained as we all are by the social and ideological circumstances in which they live. Um, it's precisely, for me, one of the fascinating um, reasons to study the classics in order to unearth such tensions and paradoxes in figures like Plato and Aristotle. Not so much to use them as a beacon of hope for us to guide us in our way, but to show us that they got trapped in their own perplexities just as we do. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie, I have a question. You, you had an organization plan. So I have an organization Short plan. Short question we're period now. now. Yes, we're going to now move to Susanna, please. Um, yes, but let me just apologize. There were, there were a number of other questions 
Yes, I'm watching my clock here. Thank you. I'm nice. waking at you. There will be time after, yeah. after the... Um, Maybe just a um, suggestion that people can write down their questions in the chat, those who did not manage to raise them. Yes, because yeah, we can yeah. save the chat and send it then to the speakers. Please, yes. um, please um, let me suggest that there will be not only the, the time at the end, but if you could send me by email all the questions and your email addresses, then I will answer them all and send them to everybody. Um, okay, and I will now turn off my microphone. Thank you all for a wonderful, the brief discussion. Am I supposed to go next or is Edward next? Stephanie, you're on mute. Stephanie, you are muted. Your sound is off. Stephanie, you need to turn on the microphone. So sorry. Edward, um, sorry. Um, Edward, if you would um, please resume the discussion. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, an enormous thanks for the invitation to present some thoughts here um, to Professor Garber and uh, to Stephanie um, and uh, to uh, Glenn and Susanna as well. Uh, some of these um, ideas I'll talk about began over a plate of soup in Florence uh, four, years, three, four years ago. Um, so uh, here's to another uh, plate of soup at some point soon. Everyone can see my screen just fine. Great, okay. The image before us remains one of the most famous paintings of the Renaissance and a key work in Titian's illustrious career. His Gloria, completed in 1554 as a commission for the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Few works better encapsulate the intertwined agencies of artist and patron of church and state than this oil on canvas painting. It pictures a vision described in Augustine of Hippo's City of God of the glory obtained by the blessed. In the foreground hovering closest to the earth are Ezekiel, Moses, Noah, and David. Higher up in the golden radiance of the Trinity, we see the emperor himself dressed in white along with his son, Philip II. Their hands are clasped in prayer, imploring for intercession within the highest ranks of sacred figures. Titian has placed his patrons almost at the level of the Virgin Mary, who appears in exquisite blue robe. And here's the Virgin, Charles and Philip. But for all its importance, this image was produced for an audience of one. It vanished completely from public view when Charles V carried it off to the monastery of Eustain in Spain, to serve as a focus for his devotions when he retired from public life in 1556. For centuries, the only access we would have, had, we would have had to this image was an engraving made by the Dutch printmaker Cornelius Court, signed and dated 1566, which you see it right here. There's a striking contrast between these two images. Media, scale, and audience are all remarkably different. The terms scholars would probably use to describe the relationship between these objects would include copy, translation, and reproduction. Invariably, such terms imply filiation and often degradation. In this view, the reproduction is derivative. With a nod to Walter Benjamin's seminal essay, it possesses a diminishing aura. Yet in a remarkable letter to Titian written in 1567, so one year after the print's publication, the Netherlandish humanist Dominicus Lamsonius set out an argument that may strike us as counterintuitive. For Lamsonius, the printed image made of mere paper and ink surpassed its painted referent, even becoming an eternal and immortal, and those are his words, manifestation of the artist's true intention. My aim here is to offer some insight into how Lamsonius came to articulate this radical theory of the printed image. I'll focus particular attention on the intellectual, political, and, um, and cultural context in which Lamsonius came to identify the ephemeral black and white printed multiple 
as the medium best suited for fulfilling the tasks of art in the turbulent years of the early Counter-Reformation. Lampsonius, the subject of my current book project, was a polymath who served as secretary to leading Catholic church officials. Trained at the University of Louvain, he had deep roots in the overlapping circles of Netherlandish humanism and artistic production, and became a guiding figure for its prominent print and book publishing industries. Hailed in his own day for his painting and poetry, as the boastful allusions to Apelles and Virgil on this print make clear, Lamsonius has rightly been described as the first historian of Netherlandish art. This reputation rests largely on his two published treatises on art. The first of these was The Life of Lambert Lombard of 1565, of which you see the frontispiece here, the title page here, excuse me. It constitutes a treatise on the humanistic approach to painting, packaged in the form of, the bio of a biography of the Liegeois painter Lambert Lombard. This was the first published biography of any Netherlandish artist and the first artistic treatise to be published in the local countries. <clears throat> Lamsonius's second treatise, conceived at the same time, but published in 1572, is known as The Effigies. It comprises a cycle of 23 portraits of Netherlandish painters, each with an inscription by Lamsonius. I show you here the portrait of Hieronymus Bosch as a representative example. <clears throat> Lamsonius's projects here played key roles in constructing what we now understand as the Northern Renaissance that spans from Van Eyck to Bruegel. At the same time, they forged a visible, visible association between Netherlandish artistic excellence and the medium of engraving, an art form notably absent from the predominant Italian artistic discourses of the time, especially as known from the first edition of Giorgio Vasari's Foundational Lives of the Artists, which had appeared in 1550. Lamsonius has published treatises advanced an implicit association between Northern artistic practice and print. But it was in a series of letters that Lamsonius sent to leading artists such as Titian that his picture theory centering on the medium of engraving first took shape. My focus today is on Lamsonius's letter to Titian and the terms he used to try to convince Europe's leading living artist to take print seriously and to consider the print as work of art. Lamsonius begins his letter by establishing his credentials as a sophisticated critic of the printed image and a knowledgeable historian of art. Lamsonius knew very little of Titian's painted work, having never traveled outside, far outside the Low Countries in his own life. But his letters reveal deep knowledge of the prints that had been made after Titian's designs. This evidence is that Lamsonius had already established a collection of such printed works, which enabled comparative study and helped foster his novel insights and aesthetic theory. From scrutiny of his visual archive, Lamsonius rightly deduces that Titian had a fraught relationship with the medium of print. In contrast to Raphael, who had cultivated a partnership with the printmaker Marcantonio Raimondi decades earlier, Titian had failed to find an engraver up to the task. After early dealings with Venetian woodcutters, such as Niccolo Boldrini, who produced large prints after Titian's complex histories, possibly including the conversion of St. Paul that we see here, Titian largely turned away from the medium of print. <clears throat> Although detailed and imposing, such woodcuts lacked the sophistication and tonality that had become key features of the work of modern engravers. For Lamsonius, even Italy's most talented engravers could not rival the skills he identified with his protege, Cornelius Court. So to prove that point, he sets up a contrast between the six prints Court had recently engraved after Titian's designs and the work of Italian printmakers who tried to engrave Titian's art, but in his eyes failed. For example, he invokes the Italian engraver Jacopo Caraglio's enunciation after Titian, which you see here, only to criticize its shortcomings relative to what court could achieve. Lamsonius describes how Caraglio's print suffers from, and I quote, fault, defect of intellect, and heaviness of hand, end quote. His critique is unforgiving. Contrasting Caraglio's work with Court's engraving of St. Jerome in the desert after Titian, Lamsonius continues. The hand of Cornelius Court is so much braver and faster and gives better grace to the clothes and to the forest-like parts of your landscapes, end quote. Side by side, we can appreciate the vivid tonalities of Court's print achieved through modulation of line, cross-hatching and extreme sensitivity to the use of blank paper as a compositional element, 
whether in the bodies of the muscular saint and lion or in the jagged faces of the rock and gnarled trees above. These clearly appear superior to Coraglio's harsh lighting, uneven modeling, bulky forms, and repetitive treatment of line. Lamsonius continues, praising, quote, that small and most lonesome desert landscape of St. Jerome, which I with greatest pleasure am able to imagine what could be colored by your Lordship's hand in such a way that the figure of St. Jerome would be as large as life as I have persuaded myself that your Lordship would have made." End quote. Lamsonius is speaking of a persuasion that is jointly personal and hypothetical. As far as we know, Titian never painted such a composition. Rather, Cornelius Court's engraving proved the power of print to create Titian in a new material form. The point of comparison is not a painting by Titian, which Lamsonius could never see, but rather a universalizing concept of what makes a Titian and Court's ability to telescope that ideal into a graphic medium. The print stands as an independent work of art, even as it retains its connection to Titian's singular creativity. Lamsonius chose words to appeal directly to Titian's acknowledged mastery of colore, the realm of painting for which his art was renowned. Only Court's engraving in Lamsonius's view allows the beholder to engage in a process of recreating Titian's colore in the mind's eye, or what he terms the occhi della mente. In effect, what Lamsonius describes here is a transcendent relationship in which the beholder of the print participates with court in the completion of Titian's work by translating colore from an outward property of the material object, that is to say a painting somewhere, to the inner space of cognition. Lamsonius' claim con conjures up a seminal artistic debate of the 16th century, that between the linear practice of disegno, rooted in drawing and associated with central Italy, and colore, or the coloristic approach associated with Venice and Titian in particular. Critics such as Vasari had already created a discourse around Titian's over-reliance on colore and his failure to master the Tuscan system of disegno. Lamsonius upholds Court's work as proof that Titian's art in fact does possess disegno, but it remains for the engraver to reveal that disegno through his self-consciously linear technique a disegno that opens the mind to the animating force of colore. Walter Melian, the scholar who has studied Lamsonius's letter in, in greatest detail to date, points to the regional polemic in which the Netherlandish engraver more successfully imitates Italian art than his Italian rival also working in print. But Lamsonius's uh, partisanship to the superiority of Netherlandish skill is important, but I want to suggest that it's only part of the picture. Lamsonius was also sketching out the rudiments of a novel theory of the printed image. The revelation of Titian's disegno in print and the movement of his colore from object to beholder are not merely aesthetic processes. They are also epistemic and deeply spiritual ones. As Lamsonius notes, it is Titian's colors that enable him to truly imitate and express life and the beauties thereof to such a degree that his colors have become, and I quote, divine, august, and immortal in print. And it is these very properties, divinity, augustness, and immortality, that Lamsonius now locates in Court's translation of Titian's art into the printed medium. Returning to the Gloria here, Lamsonius seizes upon the way in which Court's graphic rendering allowed him to see, quote, the immortal essence, end quote, of Titian's design, imprinting Titian's image within the occhia della mente, or the mind's eye. In other words, Lamsonius privileges the handheld black and white print over the oil painting, not simply because of print's accessibility, but especially because of the singular aesthetic and epistemic properties inherent to the medium. The print lifted the artist's design out of its material encumbrance in paint, affixing it as a schematic rendering directly in the viewer's mind. 
the printed images stark lines of black on white paper enabled viewers who possessed such printed replicas to have unmediated access to the essence of Titian's design stripped of the distractions of color and to the very disegno interno or inter inner design that had been divinely implanted in the artist's mind and through court's print transmitted to the mind's eye of the beholder. Samsonius is activating a platonic discourse on the monochrome, updating it for the counter-reformation context in which he was writing. In Lamsonius's novel theory of print as a work of art, colors distract, distract from true purpose. It can cause, color can cause confusion or even conflation between signifier and signified, and ultimately lead to the forms of idolatrous worship that Protestant and Catholic image theorists alike sought to expunge. This, whether through the destruction of art and iconoclastic fury, or through attempts to limit the powers of images by decree. For Lamsonius, the print responds to these concerns by reforming the image through its graphic system. In this view, the print offers a resolution to longstanding platonic skepticism of mimesis, as well as concerns of the Council of Trent, elevating and instructing the beholder without misleading him or her. Just months before Lamsonius wrote to Titian in the hot summer of 1566, iconoclasts had torn through churches in the Netherlands, city by city, systematically destroying centuries worth of art. Acting in the name of religion, these rebels, as Lamsonius describes them, were destroying Christian art in the first act of defiance leading to the Dutch revolt against the Habsburg King Philip II, now Titian's greatest patron. The propagandistic print I show you now shows the image breakers at work, sparing no painting or sculpture from the blows of their axes. For Titian, a great painter of altarpieces and beneficiary of ecclesiastical and imperial patronage, such news from the Low Countries must have come as a shock, bringing home an awareness of the existential threat posed by Protestantism. Lamsonius concludes his letter with a direct plea on these grounds. The iconoclasts, quote, destroyers of every art and cour courtesy have made a mess of everything, end quote. But print, he argues, will enable art to endure, not simply because of the multiplicity of the medium, a safeguard against any single act of iconoclastic destruction, but because of its deep congruence with the processes of visual and spiritual cognition Lamsonius situates within a distinctly Catholic framework. This context may help to explain Lamsonius's paradoxical theorization of the printed image, the most ephemeral medium of his time, as immortal. In Lamsonius's view, the engraver's art establishes a necessary symbolic distance between it, the image and what it represents. Its schematization of the image into a series of regular Buren lines could never be mistaken for anything but what it was, a made image. The rational system of engraved lines, whether when exercised by court, becomes a meaningful form in itself. Confronted with a dazzling black and white image, like the engraved Gloria, the beholder is called upon to fill in what the engraving explicitly leaves absent. The print thus becomes an ideal outward manifestation of the artist's intention. It purifies his diseño or design and becomes an instrument of sacred exercises in the beholder directly, who is confronted with an image not out of reach on an altar, but rather in his hands in the form of a printed multiple. A painting or sculpture doused in color, life-size and scale, might risk accusations of idolatry and even the wielded axe. But the schematic black and white of the handheld print defies any such conflation any attempt to see the work of art for what it patently is not. Susan Stewart has drawn attention to the ways in which the diminutive scale of such engravings and the efforts required to see them heightens our awareness of the exquisite care required in their making. The more one studies the print's lines and marvels at its creation, the more one is aware of its status as the made object. In this way, the print visible to all creates a black and white image that no single iconoclastic gesture can wipe out. Put another way, the seemingly flimsy print 
makes the image immortal. In Lamsonius's Catholic episteme, the printed image multiplies and transmits the sacred charge of a divine reference that is ultimately elusive and invisible. Through print, it becomes a form implanted in the occhi della mente, in the eye of the mind's eye of the true believer. Print, in Lamsonius's theory, takes on certain attributes of the icon not made by human hands. The printing press miraculously enables the print to avoid the human touch. Like an icon, the print possesses an agency to impress itself within the beholder's mind as the type or paradigm. The beholder continues this reflexive imprinting process by adding colore, an animating force, to the unadorned design before him. Lamsonius intimates this theory at the conclusion of his letter to Titian with an assertion that may strike us as bizarre. Unable to travel to Italy to meet Titian and kiss him personally as he would like to do, he will instead kiss the artist's self-portrait as it appears in court's print, a detail at upper right, right center rather, that had not appeared in the painting, but was carefully added to the print as a form of embodied and spiritualized signature. In this way, Lamsonius tightly closes the circle on his image discourse, such that the print itself, transmitting Titian's vision, becomes the receptor of sensuous embodied devotion once reserved for painted or sculpted forms. There is a striking proximity between Lamsonius's image theory and early Jesuit spiritual practices, but Lamsonius's focus on the power of the printed image to drive such devotional exercises is distinctive. It binds his image theory to the history of Netherlandish art and the excellence of Netherlandish engravers, whose modernity resides in their ability to schematize the sacred image in ways that ensure its replication and its movement from the world of visual sensation to inner sense, the occhi della mente in Lamsonius's words. Thank you. So many, so many thanks. Um, so I know how to recognize people. I've got the hands. Um, uh, Margaret, um, do you have your hand up, please? Hello there, everyone. Um, yes, I well, I was partly clapping because that was just super interesting. Ed, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering about some of the specific details of print, um, in particular the way that the landscape and the cloud are quite distinct from the painting. They're obviously placed, and of course, your very interesting point about the self-portrait petition being put in. But there are points where it is called very self-consciously, I think, depart from the painting. And I wonder if you'd say a little bit more about what you think those very heavy clouds, they become very, very heavy in the print, and the different kind of features of the landscape, what it is that he's up to down there, please. Thank you for that excellent question. I think that um, in a number of passages, including the clouds, the musculature and the landscape, Court is deliberately refashioning Titian's, Titian for the medium of print and um, creating elements to his style that work in the graphic medium that he himself had not necessarily explored in the same way in painting. Um, the clouds are one feature that needs to be more uh, readable at the scale of print than it needs to be in the gold high up on the large painted altarpiece. Um, so there is a deliberate, um, there's a deliberate recreation of those forms for the graphic medium. Um, so it's certainly not a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, with the painted work. So too in the musculature, um, which does a related thing in making Titian's bodies more legible and um, distinct in the printed medium, then I think they appear uh, in the painting itself. So I think that's the process that's going on. And as to the mechanics of it, which I find fascinating, we know that Court was not working from the painting, although he may have been familiar with it, but rather with a series of drawings produced for the purpose. So Titian also has an agency in driving uh, the, the reformation of his graphic language for the printed medium. Thanks. Yeah. 
Daniel, did you have a question, Professor um, Yes, I did. Um, I think it's very interesting, uh, Lansonis's idea that somehow or another, you take away the color, you just have the lines, the black and white, you're, you're um, representing in a much better way, the real essence of the artist's vision. But um, I'm wondering where, certainly later, prints were colored. People would take these engravings and color them. Was that a practice at that point and um, at that moment? And what would Lansonius make of people who would want to add color to the, um, 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 to the engraved lines? Uh, that's an excellent question, and I have to bow to uh, my teacher, uh, Joseph Kerner, who is in the room as well, for uh, the insight of a famous quote uh, from Erasmus on the work of Durer. If you paint color on these prints, which was common practice at the time, you ruin them. Um, that their graphic language should, should speak for itself. That doesn't mean that it prevented people from engaging uh, in, the, in the practice of coloring uh, images coloring uh, engravings. And in fact, we know that the large Antwerp publishing houses employed uh, colorers who colored in printed works. But I think it's not noteworthy that if you go and survey uh, major print collections, these sorts of works generally are not colored, that there was a pervasive sense that they stand on their own without the application of additional uh, color. So, um, but I, I would say that Lamsonius would agree with and knew the writings of Erasmus who had made that comment about Albrecht Durer's work, graphic work. Thank you. Do we have questions from Richard Strugger and from Joseph Kerner. Richard? Uh, yes, thank you. I, um, I thought this was a fascinating uh, paper and um, what it suggested to me was the way in which uh, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation uh, came together mm -hmm. in a sort of uh, critique of uh, medieval uh, idolatry. Uh, and um, so that this um, uh, uh, preference for uh, print and the, the special intellectual and divine quality of print would State, stated by itself, one would think, oh, that's a Protestant thing. And here you're showing that it's uh, a, here a meant as a deeply uh, counter-Reformation thing. And so I thought that that's just really quite a fascinating uh, piece of uh, cultural uh, uh, collision or uh, collusion or coming together uh, in a kind of surprising way. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much for that insight. Uh, I, and I absolutely agree. And I think that a large part of Lansonius's project coming from um, a Catholic counter-reformation perspective uh, is reclaiming the print, the medium of print for the Catholic cause because it was so closely associated, as you say, um, with the dissemination of heresy through the corner press uh, and cheap woodcut or with the Protestant cause, it's particularly in German speaking lands and the emanation of print from there. So I think that this, um, that his image theory is not sort of starting from a religious sort of um, ground zero as it were, but rather as a response to a discourse that had, or, that had already existed in Protestant circles and that he's bringing over to a distinctly Catholic cause at the time. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Joseph. Hello, everyone. Hi, Edward. Great uh, talk. Um, so picking up actually on, the, on that matter about Reformation, Counter-Reformation, as you know, the German word for the broadsheet uh, was the, is the Flugblatt, the fluttering page. And a Flugblatt really emphasizes the fact that a piece of paper, a leaf, comes to uh, multiple people. And the, the, the wonder of the print, uh, and I felt that a lot teaching uh, virtually with Zoom, because woodcuts are great virtual on a Zoom screen. There's something about the medium that works on Zoom, but how much more remarkable must it have been to have a Titian in your hand? So one question I have is, uh, it, there seems to be a tension in your account between on the one hand, the claims, the sort of platonic claims of the image, the printed image, 
inoculating the visual image against, uh, against claims of idolatry on the one hand. And then on the other hand, something that's there in all the material, and you even mentioned the, the wonder about the transformation of color into, uh, into the engraved uh, technology and the engraved uh, inscriptive language is actually a material thing. It's ink on a, a piece of paper. And when uh, Susan Stewart talks about the miniature, it's partially about the materiality of the miniature. So I wonder if you might um, tease out a kind of anti-Platonic reading of the print, because I think prints must have felt when they came uh, wondrous in that you had it in front of you for the first time you could have a petition uh, rather than some kind of abstraction or memory. Um, I think that that's an excellent point and I think it's one that I need to um, give further uh, thought to um, is, and in a way Lamsonius himself is attentive to um, to that slippery slope when he kisses the object, um, when he um, gives it this very sort of um, embodied uh, and in a way destructive almost <laughs> response to it, this very sort of sensuous uh, worship of it, that that, um, I, you know, I said in the paper that it sort of closes the circle on his argument about the print sort of becoming the icon through mm -hmm. this reformation of its, of the graphic language, but, um, you could also see that as an acknowledgement of the sort of almost the erotics of possessing a Titian in your own hands mm -hmm. and having that experience with it. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I could nuance the way in which I'm reading that gesture of his or that the rhetorical gesture of the gesture that he that he describes there um, because of it, the very sensuous, sensuous nature of it, where he's acknowledging that very point that you're raising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, ooh, I have to, oh, do I have my microphone? Yeah, I do. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, if we could please, um, if Susanna Bergen could please join us with her microphone and her slides, that would be lovely. Uh, I hope you can all see the slide now. I too want to start by thanking Stephanie, Dan, uh, Dana, Vlad, and Claudia for organizing this wonderful event. It's um, a huge pleasure to be here and also a particular pleasure to, to see Dan and uh, to see, sorry, Edward and Glenn again, though I wish, um, like Edward said, that we were in a restaurant in Florence. So in its most classic form, an anamorphosis presents a deformed view of an entity that is executed in such a way that when the distorted image is observed from a precise vantage point or by reflection from a particular mirror or through a special lens, it no longer looks contorted. Leonardo da Vinci created the earliest known European anamorphic renderings in his Codex Atlanticus. They display the warped face of a child and an elongated eye. And of course, a famous anamorphosis features in Hans Holbein's Ambassadors. When observed frontally, a distorted skull occupies the painting's foreground. If the image is examined from its extreme right edge, the skull appears more legible, though still somewhat distorted from this perspective. As Jorgis Beltrusati's Agostino de Rosa and other scholars have stressed, in the 17th century, Jesuits and Minims became leaders in the creation and study of anamorphoses. For instance, a work by the Jesuit Mario Bettini presents instructions for how to produce anamorphic images of an eye and a rose. And between 1639 and the beginning of 1640, the Minim friar Jean-François Niceron painted an anamorphic fresco a secco representing Saint John the Evangelist writing of his prophetic visions on the island of Patmos. The, the fresco spans part of the northern arm of the eastern corridor of the first floor of the convent of Trinita dei Monti in Rome. In the Minim Place Royale convent in Paris, Niceron authored two further anamorphic wall frescoes that no longer survive. 
One again represented St. John the Evangelist writing of his prophetic visions. These anamorphoses elicited deceptive perceptual states in which one thing could be mistaken for another. What at one moment looked incoherent at another resembled a landscape. Subsequently, the observer's confusion shifted by moving in space or by looking at a specular ref reflection or through a special lens from this initial confusion to states of comparative perceptual clarity. Following Giulio Carlo Argon's observation in 1954 that Baroque art reconfigures representation and rhetorical terms in order to affect and persuade observers, scholars have repeatedly called attention to the interrelations between 16th and 17th century Italian art theory and practice on the one hand and rhetorical theory on the other. In Counter-Reformation Italy, the rhetorical foundations of sacred art were laid out expressly by Gabriele Pagliotti, the Bishop of Bologna, who wrote in his famous post-Tridentine treatise that images are supposed to move the hearts of observers to devotion and the true cult of God. Uh, Sorry about that, there was an issue with my slide. So given the longstanding elevation of clarity in the West from Aristotle onwards as a rhetorical virtue and the concomitant criticism of obscurity as an obstacle to persuasive discourse, the popularity in counter-reformation circles of anamorphic images, which plunge observers into states of perceptual confusion may seem somewhat counterintuitive. Throughout his landmark study of optical marvels, La Perspective Curieuse, Niceron calls attention to how viewing anamorphic images involves a transition from a state of confusion to one of clarity. Consider, for instance, his title for a section on producing anamorphic images. So he writes, to give the method to describe all sorts of figures that seem confused in appearance and from a certain point represent perfectly a proposed object. How are we to reconcile this vogue for images that embrace visual confusion with a period conception of the visual arts as instruments of persuasion that was rooted in ancient notions of the importance of clarity and rhetoric? In view of the centrality of ancient rhetoric to the development of early modern Italian art theory and practice, to make sense of the obscure forms of early modern anamorphoses, it's helpful to turn to the distinction between well-founded and objectionable obscurity in Cicero's On the Ends of Good and Evil. In this text, Cicero holds that obscurity can be excusable if it is deliberately adopted or if it is due to the obtruseness of the subject. In the latter case, obscurity could function as a diagnostic instrument that signals the legitimacy of critical discourse or commentary on a text. Pagliotti echoes Cicero's justification of obscurity arising from the perplexity of a subject. So he writes, sometimes the attempt is made to express things that by nature cannot be expressed, things so recondite and difficult that there is no easy way to convey them to folk like the operations of intelligences, the secrets of divine providence, the mysteries of predestination, and so on. So on. This passage clarifies how Jesuits and Minims might have justified their anamorphoses vis-a-vis -vis the rhetorical framing of sacred imagery insofar as the iconographies of these images pertain to recondite and difficult things, and even as I will demonstrate to the secrets of divine providence and the mysteries of predestination. The contrast between confusion and clarity evoked by anamorphoses assists the movement from an obscure source requiring interpretation to a clarifying experience of an inner spiritual discernment. To Victor Stoichida, sacred paintings in 16th and 17th century Spain were important instruments in the creation of visions and the illusionism of these paintings augmented observers' spiritual reactions. Following this line of thought, I argue that Minim and Jesuit anamorphic images should be conceptualized as having evinced an appreciation of the heightened power of such highly illusionistic imagery 
to trigger an understanding in observers of recondite and difficult spiritual matters to activate clarifying inner visions. According to Bettini, a few months after the spring in which he had composed demonstrations for how to produce anamorphoses of an eye and a rose, he learned that Girolamo Colonna had been made a cardinal and shortly thereafter Archbishop of Bologna. Bettini asserts that his practical explanations had foreshadowed Colonna's elevation. So he writes, of course, optic knowledge anticipated in time and pre-signified these favorable omens for my homeland. If for Bettini, it was self-evident that perspectival research on optics and images that came to be known as anamorphoses could foretell future events, the links between this field of inquiry and divination is less intuitive today. Bettini explains, when you see an eye in the columnar mirror, see in your mind a pastoral foresight of the most eminent Cardinal Colonna, and from these things, our optic reformations, know the future health of souls and the reformed customs of the Church of Bologna, if by chance there was a deforming. When you see a rose in the columnar mirror, recognize the sacred purple of our priest, and in it, the choicest rose of charity towards his people. Recognize in the same sacred hero Colonna as if a certain columnar mirror in which the special lights of all these virtues appear and gleam marvelously, which virtues are sought in the sacred purple prince and in the best pastor of minds. Let there be an end of this earlier introductory essay in this fortuitous optical foretelling. In this passage that evokes the mirrors of Prince's genre, Bettini clarifies the link between his optical devices and prognostication while flattering Colonna in a form that is as elaborate as it is recherché. The eye in the mirror foreshadows Colonna's eye and in particular his capacity to discern what must happen to ensure the salvation of his congregation and church. The rose in the columnar mirror prefigures the color of the cardinal's vestments and Colonna's charitable actions. Colonna is also compared to the columnar mirror, just as the mirror reforms a deformed eye, Colonna reforms a deformed church. Just as a mirror reflects light, Colonna reflects virtues. Bettini's and the reader's optic reformations, that is their rearrangements of images of distended eyes and roses in columnar mirrors, are associated with the reformations of souls and of the procedures of the Bolognese church under Cardinal Colonna. Moreover, the columnar mirrors allude to the name Colonna, which means column. This alleged similarity between visual and spiritual reformations renders Bettini's optic knowledge a prophetic symbol of Colonna's elevation. Although Bettini's text offers insights into why he took it to be the case that his research on optics foretold Colonna's fate, the link he asserts between visual and religious deformations and reformations requires unpacking. It is not self-evident why a reformation of an image observed in a cylindrical mirror is compared to the reform of souls and the church. To clarify Bettini's investment in divination by mirrors and the apparent similarity he asserts between visual and spiritual deformations and reformations, let's turn to Niceron's anamorphic images. Niceron's anamorphic fresco in Trinità dei Monti in Rome was only uncovered beneath thick layers of paint and plaster following a restoration that began in 2005. And I have to thank Agostino de Rosa um, for sharing his photographs of the uh, fresco with me, which I'm in turn um, showing to you this morning or evening, depending on uh, where you are in the world. The composition, which is severely damaged and very difficult to make out in these photographic composition, uh, reproductions, grows out of an enormous olive tree nestled into the northeastern corner of the hallway. The tree outlines the top and left sections of the composition and remains legible as observers traverse the space, whereas the representations in the area below seem to change. A landscape of craggy cliffs, pathways, and waterfalls unfolds below the tree. Once observers arrive at the floor's southeastern corner, the natural scenery becomes illegible and an image of St. John the Evangelist writing his prophetic visions emerges instead. And I've annotated this slide 
um, to help you see the ear, the back, and the profile um, of St. John. So if from this end of the hall, observers perceive St. John holding a quill pen, when the same detail is seen head on, the pen reads as a waterfall. In this way, the image oscillates between the gigantic St. John and the miniature representations within the landscape. Because of the ways in which the painting's representations seem to shift as observers move through the corridor, early modern beholders may well have wondered whether they were seeing a painting or experiencing a vision. The illusionism of the anamorphosis augments the intensity of the observer's inner spiritual reaction. Nisehon, like Bettini, encourages readers' practical guidance for how to conduct optical research themselves so that they can gain an understanding of and familiarity with visual deceptions. Consider Nisehon's discussion of his procedure for coordinating the colors and shading of elements from each coextensive representation, that is from the landscape and from the image of St. John and the anamorphosis in the Place Royale convent in Paris. So he writes, in this way, we placed in the dark and shadowy folds of the green tunic, dense forests and groves composed of many trees. In the brighter or conspicuous parts of this tu tunic, golden cornfields and already ripe fruits of the crops. In the white belt, a river's flow or a fountain's waters. In the white sheets of the open book, a huge lake and in it harbors, shores, ships, fishermen and so on. In the head, caverns, caves, steep cliffs, rocks, edifices, indeed the ruin and downfall of the whole city of Babylon, for which we even place the angels sounding trumpets. The two represented images within Nicerin's Parisian anamorphosis of St. John were closely related to one another, not just on a formal level, but on a thematic one as well. From an oblique angle, the fresco showed St. John on the island of Patmos, writing about the revelation. From another vantage point, the same wall painting presented the contents of the revelation, the fall of Babylon, and the trumpets that cue the apocalyptic events. Insofar as the former image foretold the latter, Nicerin's anamorphosis, like Bettini's, can be seen to bring together optics and religious prognostication. It is the essence of a prophetic revelation that what it reveals can be seen here on earth only obscurely through a glass darkly with the implicit promise that it will be seen clearly and face to face in the hereafter. And hence it makes sense that Nicerin takes the writing of the apocalypse as his subject. Nicerin also comments on an inscription pertaining to the revelation that he places on the binding of a book in his anamorphic fresco in Trinita dei Monti. So he writes, I recall the projection delineated in the Roman convent in this way, alluding to the Greek words that I placed on the very book of the evangelist that he holds before his hands. And I displayed the words, a revelation of this perspective, the eyewitness of the apocalypse to be read by the spectators. The rhetorical power of the Greek inscription, a revelation of this perspective, the eyewitness of the apocalypse, lies in part in Nicerin's wordplay. He deploys a kind of pun known as an antimaclasis, which features the repetition of a word in a different sense. The word apocalypsis, meaning an uncovering or revealing of something, appears twice, first in the nominative and then in the genitive. The first time apocalypsis occurs without a definite article, but the second time it is accompanied by one such that the reader understands the word to refer here to the biblical revelation or the apocalypse. In addition, the words optikes, perspective, or autotes, eyewitness, both share a root which has to do with seeing. The annotations deploys word plays around seeing in the service of comparing Nicerin's vision to St. John's. Just as the saint presented the revelation, Nicerin presents a revelation of his perspective. The inscription suggests that the act of experiencing the fresco helps observers to understand perspective and its optical trickery, and that this understanding is also related to religious prognostication, that is to the secrets of divine providence and the mysteries of predestination. Nicerin's frescoes and his discussion of the frescoes add context to Bettini's comparison between optical research and religious revelation. 
in Nisehan's works as in Bettini's book, an understanding of perspective, the science of optics is conjoined with an understanding of religious prognostication. The quality of visual discernment comes to signal that of religious foresight. The future cannot be simply seen, one needs to know how to look. A revelation of the future requires decoding. An investment in the interrelations between optics and religious revelation is not only apparent in Nisehan's anamorphic wall painting, it is also manifest in his suggestion in his book, Curious Perspective, to create deceptive images that offer prognostications. In particular, he discusses predictive images employed together with an optical device that uses a multifocal beveled lens to produce a single figure out of multiple separate figures. In his text and in tables, he describes what makes it possible for multiple renderings of Ottoman sultans when viewed through a perspective glass tube to combine into a cohesive portrait of Louis XIII. Moreover, he situates his representations of sultans and Louis XIII, who was understood at the time as a reflection of God's power in relation to prognostication. So he writes, this design is made in regard to the prophecy which Muhammad formerly left to his followers, recommending that they never offend the French monarchy because their empire would never be ruined except by the power of one of its kings. On this wish to show that the honor of this conquest does not belong to anyone other than Louis the Just, we have contrived that most of the emperors in this tableau pay tribute to him, such that they contribute each some part of themselves to form his image, as if they were despoiling themselves to honor his triumph. The French scholar and Orientalist Guillaume Postel mentions this prophecy in his The Treasury of the Prophecies of the Universe, which was written between 1564 and 66. He explains in this passage, which I don't have time to read to you, that the Muslim prophecy predicted that Ottoman rule would be crushed in, a, in an attack by the so-called yellow peoples. Postel clarifies that the so-called yellow peoples were taken to be the goals. Nisehan's device thus presents yet another instance of the science of optics becoming conjoined with religious prognostication. Beyond his discussion of this instrument of political propaganda, Nisehan suggests further iconographies for the optical contraption that also offer prognostications. One can take from the Old Testament all the figures of the same meaning and contrive that being painted and arranged on the plan according to the prescribed rules, they only represent by the telescope the figured thing. I also had the thought several times to paint some prophets of those who spoke more expressly of the Virgin and the Incarnation, each with a flying band, on which was written the words of the prophecy, as for example, Isaiah with the words, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and contrive that by the telescope, we see only the Virgin with the inscription, I serve the Lord. Since the Hebrew Bible was often interpreted as prefiguring the events in the New Testament, this account again illustrates a movement from an obscure source requiring interpretation, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, to a clarifying vision, the New Testament. Users of Nisehan's imagined optical device first looked at the prophets and then beheld the Virgin through the telescope moments later. In this way, the temporal progress of observers mirrors the movement forward in time from the age of the prophets to that of the Virgin, if on a much smaller scale. This chronological reflection embedded in the device's use and iconography may have contributed to the vividness of the prophecy. Both Nisehan and Bettini published encyclopedic works pertaining to mathematical curiosities and both instructed students in their respective orders. Nisseron taught mathematics at Trinità dei Monti and Bettini professed philosophy and mathematics in Parma. Whereas Nisseron advocated using known prophecies as subjects for optical devices, Bettini by contrast claimed that his demonstrations for how to produce optical devices had offered a prognostication that he was originally unaware of. Notwithstanding the differences in their respective knowledge of the prophecies figured by their optical devices, Bettini and Nisseron helped to uncover how acts of viewing anamorphoses 
could be reconciled with rhetorical conceptions of the function of visual art. The move from confusion to greater clarity in the viewing of an anamorphic image is like the move from confusion to clarity when we progress from faith and revelation here on earth to the direct viewing of the divine and the Empyrean. Discernment in the science of seeing became coterminous with, with discernment in seeing not only the practice Susanna, Daniel, can you turn on your microphone? I think we have lost. I think I think we've lost Susanna. Let me, uh, I, just, I just sent her a note. Or I'm about to. Um, I'm not sure what we can do. Uh, this happens to me. I think her computer froze, and she simply yeah, has to re. She has to reconnect. She has to reconnect. I think so. Does she know she has to reconnect? Would you like me to send her an email? I yes, oh, she should. She should, because her screen is frozen. Well, if her screen is frozen, she won't receive an email from me either, will she? No, she will. Email separate. No. Okay. Screen is frozen only because of Zoom, but you, she should get an email. Email will, will come. Okay. She already disconnected, didn't she? Should we use this time for uh, one of the older questions or something? If we could. If, if it takes I don't have a minute. mobile number. Well, I just sent I just sent her a uh, an email. Edward, do you have her home mobile number? Uh, I'm just looking to see if I do. Mm, not a current one, no. Sorry. In the meantime, we could ask one another questions about her lecture. Well, um, Stephanie um, asked to raise her hand about something. And um, Stephanie, would you like to ask a question? Stephanie Fan? Yeah, it's too glamorous because it's quite interesting. The history of Princeton to accept uh, women students is related to Plato's Republic, especially my granddaughter. Like my grand dog father Velastos was talking with the president of Princeton University at that time that you see in Plato, women can also do philosophy. So in the 1970s, they began to recruit women students, according to Professor Grafton. So my question about your talk is the dimension of deception and the seduction related to the concept of Samasus. I think I have sent you the notes. I mean, the Achilles sheet made by Hephaestus provokes wonder because it's an energia effect. At the same time, it's also artificial. In Hesiod, when he used idol to describe uh, like a pendula, it's a kind of deceptive effect. And uh, Socrates was considered to be a seducer, at least for Kierkegaard. So I don't know whether for later philosophers like uh, Aristotle, you mentioned there's I mentioned you know, or seduction related to doing philosophy and the wonder. Um, Stephanie, thank you very much for your question. I've written it down from the, I've saved it from the chat as I've also saved the questions of Steph Marston, Richard Stryer and Michael Deckard. And what I'm gonna do is um, respond to all of you by email um, and um, that way give answers that, that um, can come to the benefit of everyone. I'd rather not answer your question now because I think that we should focus upon Susanna's lecture. Um, but then at the end, perhaps if there's time, I'll come back to your question, okay? I will answer it one way or another, either by email or by speech. 
Thank you. Has anybody heard from Susanna? I'm trying to reach her with Yes, she computer. said that her internet has died at home. Uh, she sent me a text that her internet has died at home. So, uh, oh my God. Would she be able, would she be able to uh, phone in from her phone and just have the audio? Yes, do you, uh, could you put the number for the Zoom in the uh, chat perhaps? Yes, let me, yes, let me just find the, Oh, wait, maybe I can get it as well. No, I don't have the phone number there. So that's a new challenge for the Princeton Bucharest seminar, reaching via phone. So, so this is the meet, let me, let me find the, uh, the number. This is the meeting ID. She might be able to use uh, Zoom on her phone. Okay. Oh, and this is the one with all the phone numbers. So that's that great. great. But perhaps we could take general questions. I'm just worried that if we spend 10 minutes waiting and then Susanna comes back, we'll be out of time. Well, I was going to actually ask um, people to start to connect um, to what um, to uh, the things that that um, Susanna was talking about and Ed was talking about. Um, that these are relating back to what Glenn uh, started off with. I remember remembering, um, were you Glenn end um, that one paper with talking about the uh, the sh shift from the very uh, happy, cheerful kind of thing to some of the things that we're looking at here, where uh, and where there's a, a resumption of a different conception of wonder. My own sense is that it is happening around the time of Dante and Giotto, and that uh, that. So I would like to hear from you, Glenn, if, you know how you would see this within the traditions that you are looking at. Um, thank you, Stephanie. That your question raises a question that I was going to actually ask of um, Susanna, um, and perhaps I can. Exactly. Um, answer and, and ask at the same time. Um, what's interesting for me in the um, Greek material that I was looking at um, is that at the beginning, wonder is, is perfectly fine. Um, the fact that, that you don't understand what you look at and are amazed by um, expresses its power and it's a perfectly happy situation. Whereas Starting with Plato, um, wonder is justified not on, in itself, but only because it leads to the end of wonder and to um, understanding. So that um, there's a shift from, let's say, confusion to clarity. Um, and the confusion is only justified insofar as it is um, the first step leading to clarity. Um, what struck me about the material that Susanna was looking at um, was that she was focusing above all on the question of prognostication and prediction. But it seems to me that there is another aspect um, in which the um, anamorphoses would be obviously of interest to counter-reformation thinkers. Mm -hmm. And that is that an anamorphosis, if you look at it from anywhere but one point, will be total confusion. But if you look at it from the one point, then you understand what's there. Mm -hmm. And looking at it from the one point is like allowing, is like being guided by the church with the true faith to see how things really are. Mm -hmm. Most of us um, without the church are in total confusion, but if we assume the right vantage point, we will see what things are all about. Um, and that seems to me to make the counter-reformation fascination with anamorphosis not at all um, counterintuitive. Um, it would have been astonishing if in the Counter-Reformation, artists who loved to do all kinds of extraordinary things, um, think, think of Bernini, um, would not have um, thought of this too as a way to 
guide people to an understanding of the true religion. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's yeah, so I, I'm, I'm going to agree with you on that. Um, I think that that uh, not to hold on to this uh, discussion in that way, but I think um, my own sense right now is um, inside of the, the history of conceptions of objects. Uh, Suzanne isn't here, but my own understanding, and this would agree with what you're saying, is um, you know Dante also in the proceeds from one of his uh, positions in the Commedia to the next, to the position, to the next position until he gets the final one. And it is on one hand, uh, yes, in each of the conditions, in each of the previous conditions, uh, uh, we are uh, in, we do not see things correctly. So our, uh, it is counterintuitive to us. The uh, inferno is counterintuitive intuitive, the uh, purgatory to his count. At the end of the day, uh, the, of course, Beatrice then shows him the one way. Now, of course, like you're saying, it's just this one point of view, okay? And it isn't, you know, ha and it is very, very much about this problematic sort of, uh, on the one hand, uh, the democratizing implications of the uh, poetic uh, optics that is uh, uh, that Dante and people are working with, and on the other hand, which is democratizing, and the other hand, the poetic optics is is definitely not democratizing. This is a point that uh, Edward Woke is struggling with the whole time too, uh, and we are constantly, uh, uh, you know, came to the conclusion that he's actually quite an elitist. If uh, Edward, could you take that point there? Um, well, that idea of multiple uh, viewpoints is one that struck me because it comes back to the question that, that Joseph was asking a bit of, you know, uh, all of a sudden art is democratized in a way everyone can have his or her own perspective on the thing and even in sort of embodied experience of the object and multiple uh, possess it. And, um, and yet there's a, there's, the discourse itself is an elitist one, and even the medium is. We're not talking about cheap woodcuts in the case of what I'm discussing. These are uh, engravings for a very sort of sophisticated audience. And that gets to a question that was placed in the chat. Of what effect might this, um, might this one sort of thinker have had on um, the perception of value of print? Um, the, and the answer I wanted to sort of give to that was through the production of more and sort of the creation of a new generation of printmakers who respond in a certain way to certain types of images. Um, so not in the uh, sense of beholders who, res who, are, um, who have access to this discourse, but in the production of more images that create uh, this sort of larger imaginary. That went a bit off the rails, but I think that's what I was trying to... <laughs> to uh, say in response to that. Daniel, did, Daniela, did, Daniela, did you have a question? Uh, well, Susanna, much that, more general no. and very uh, basic and not, for, not well formulated. But I was uh, trying to relate to what I have heard tonight. You know, it strikes me that um, as a philosophical theme, wonder as a starting point in philosophy uh, has something still with the pursuit of truth. Uh, while at the end point, you know, what Stephanie was showing us, there is a, a very strong intention of deceit in the creation of wonder. Um, and, you know, just, just take Holbein's painting, which is full of elements of deceit. The anamorphosis is just one element of deceit. And, um, and, and then there is a lot about the power of the artist to deceive. So how, so what I see at the beginning and at the end of tonight are basically a very different points um, that kind of you, you, your, you're kind of uniting. Can we revise the steps through which we go from one extreme to the other, perhaps? Would you care about 
connecting the two points again for us. How can you, is that, is that, I'm not quite sure about that question, which, who you're trying to speak to. If, if you think it's relevant in any way to any of the speakers, if you don't think it's relevant, we can move. I, I next, think that it is, it is highly relevant. We, I mean, I think that um, in general, um, there are so many different um, disciplines that we're traversing here. We are rethinking, to use that dreadful term again, um, rethinking uh, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, rethinking disenchantment models and uh, secularization models of the history of art, um, trying uh, often back and forth between, uh, I think that, that, that I, I, I can hold on to what Glenn, his answer was, you know, it's maybe, not to throw new light on Dante from the perspective offered by Wittgenstein. Okay, no, 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 no. It's a rather, oh, Susanna. Yeah, I am so sorry. Oh, My yeah. sincerest apologies no, to everybody. This has never happened before and I'm so, so sorry. No apologies, we're so happy. So Can am I, but I'm, I'm so embarrassed. Um, and I, I didn't hear your full question, which is why I couldn't respond because I came in the middle. Well, we are all um, talking about how nice your talk is, okay, and how much it's uh, relating to, and we're feeling really quite funny because um, we want to ask you the question uh, and so on. So I would prefer that you just carry on because I do think we have time for you to carry on if you would, can do that. That was the end of my talk. The miracle was that it ended in the last line oh, and then well, it was like over. So um, the complete... Completely not admitted. Yeah, I, well, now you're here and now we can ask you questions, which is really, really good, okay? But then um, I'd, love, I'd love to answer your question. I just didn't hear the full thing. Yeah, so, okay, okay. let me direct the question to you then, Susanna. I, uh, there is something about deception in all these anamorphoses, yeah. intentional yeah. deception, that somehow goes against uh, what I took uh, to be the beginning of the session tonight, which is right. that one is about knowledge. Right. In Niceron's anamorphosis, wonder is more about the power of the painter to trick us, which is much more connected, let's say, to the tradition of natural magic than to the tradition of philosophy. And yet you seem to be saying that this is not true. So I wanted you to re-argue or- Yeah, you know, no, th thank you so much. For that wonderful question and again sincerest apologies to everyone so i mean one of the things that i'm interested in thinking about more in this larger project are the contradictory ways in which visual experience has been discussed in the scholarship um, on on the early modern period so like you point out i think really well um, on the one hand scholars have characterized this period as a moment when there's a um, rising interest in empiricism, naturalism, and a commitment to using visual representations to convey knowledge to people who trust what they see. But then at the same time, a second group of scholars that's often ignoring the others and vice versa says that this is a, a period characterized by deception and deceit and a mistrust of the visual and this sort of enjoyment of, of playful images whose meanings are um, unsure. And maybe that, that kind of dichotomy was enacted even in the session as, as you're suggesting. But what I'm actually interested in is um, the ways in which both of those strands um, coexisted in the 17th century and related to one another. Um, and the period that, um, that sees the rise out of these thought out, carefully articulated um, communal practices of observation is also the period of, of deception and deceit. And it's precisely because both of these strands exist that there's this um, interest uh, in this period in educating observers eyes so that they can um, find their way through that, uh, those sort of contradictory uh, conceptions of vision. Actually, if I could ask Susanna a question, I was just wondering, uh, as um, uh, 
and there's a turn in your paper, and I wondered if there was if there's a discourse at the time that these are frivolous, uh, if there's a response against the sort of frivolity of right. Yeah. I mean, it's a wonderful question. I mean, obviously there's the famous um, Panofsky essay that looks at Galileo's sort of um, uh, dis distrust of anamorphic images. But I think, um, it, I think at the same time, patrons of Galileo are also paying to have these kinds of images um, integrated into their private collections or their, their castles. So um, I, I'm interested in the ways in which these aren't just sort of frivolous entertainment um, devices, which they are to some extent, but they're also um, at the same time Logical function, the philosophical function. They're produced by, um, you know, Mignon and Niceron um, were both professors of philosophy as well as, um, you know, the artists who designed these works. So, um, and I don't think that it's just for sort of a frivolous entertainment. There's, it's also a way in which it helps to work out um, these difficult ideas of um, recondite and difficult matters, like in the, the Pagliotti quote. Given our technical difficulties, I think we can go a little over time for 10 or 15 minutes. So everyone has time for the general discussion. Is that okay, Stephanie? Pardon? Is it, is it okay if we go a little over time? So we have another 10 or 15 minutes. You have to raise your hand if you want to ask a question. I'm fine with that. Just turn on your microphones and speak i see richard has a question oh go ahead i was um i was just trying to think about the whole uh this whole wonderful session uh together and um it struck me that that we started with a kind of um with glenn's very beginning a sort of uh, completely benign uh view of wonder that didn't go anywhere at all but was perfectly okay, just was there. Uh, and it seems that as, as we've moved all the way from whatever that was uh, to Plato to the 17th century, um, the um, wonder itself gets less and less uh, respect and it has to lead somewhere, that it's, it's, it's more and more uh, pointing somewhere or being utilized uh, in some way or other, either uh, if it works properly towards philosophy or later if it works properly towards whichever side of the religious divide you're on. But it just struck me that, that um, something that starts off as a sort of um, uh, kind of ordinary, acceptable human reaction with um, not much else connected to it uh, becomes increasingly uh, utilitarianized, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone wants to expand on that or dispute I, it, but it yep. struck me as, as, yeah. as true of the session. Dan, do you have something to say? Dan, you need to turn on your mic. Your microphone is off. Um, yes, yes, I do. And in, in part in relation to what Susanna was talking about, in part what Richard was talking about, one of the one of the things I was actually a little surprised that has that hasn't come up in any of the discussions is the um, early modern theories of the passions. Mm -hmm. In particular, one of the 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 um, theories of the passions that was probably most influential. Uh, which was Descartes' uh, Passion de l'âme. Mm -hmm. um, Descartes, of course, was associated with Mersenne, with the Minims, um, certainly knew um, about Niceron. Um, and for him, wonder is the first of the passions. It is what leads us, um, you know, it leads us into knowledge. It's not merely utilitarian, I think, as, as Richard was suggested was suggesting but um, um, it was it was probably the most in in a way the most important of the mm -hmm. questions and um, how does that fit in 
But it's important because it leads somewhere, right, Ben? Not in itself. But it's not it's not utilitarian. Well, it's important. I it's just mean utilitarian in the sense of leading to somewhere else. Not as, valuable as, as opposed to something that is just valuable in itself. Right. Well, I should. I can say that um, I can. Um, what you're saying, Daniel, is very, very um, true. And um, my whole thinking about doing this uh, group here is actually um, raised um, in light of the seminar that you had on wonder um, with Descartes and different sorts of people, and your discussion with Spinoza and so on. It's a very interesting turning there. The, the question then, and that's the, that we, we are finding that out, and this has to do with illustration. And the point you're making is that, um, you know, how did early modern philosophers think about pictures actually and about wonder and so on? And here, my, my great, you know, my inspiration for a lot of this has been um, the work of, of, of Biagra and scientific illustration, where he says that, you know, very clearly about Descartes, about wonder, and about the necessity of having illustrations to actually see the sorts of things from the points of view uh, that that Susanna is talking about, and and so on. Okay, so I mean that there is this interface of to what extent are and that's what goes back to Martin Kemp's uh, thing about the. Uh, what what has all become ingrained in early modern science and early modern philosophy about pictures, about wonder, that we then seem to have at some point uh, removed from our understanding of early modern philosophy. Um, and, uh, you know, for instance, uh, most early modern philosophers will know the work of Dante and will take him probably quite philosophically seriously. Um, and there's no research on that. I search in vain um, for that kind of uh, thing. And so these are issues and they are relevant to us today, back to, uh, they're relevant to us today because um, of the significance of uh, the wonder. I will, Alberto, you are raising your hand. Alberto? Yeah, I'm here, thank you. Hi. Hi. I, uh, well, I was uh, I was thinking in, in more than a question. Well, initially it was a question for 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 um, um, Edward, but well, more more a question is a comment. You know, try to connect Edward uh, talks and, and also Susanna, and I was you know wondering, not wondering. You know, thinking in it struck me the idea of the image as immortal that in some moment Edward said. And came to my mind during the 16th century, a chronicle from, from a, a German adventurer who was uh, Hans Staden. And he printed a, a, a work. Hans Staden was an adventurer who in some moment of his life was in, living in, in Brazil with some indigenous people. I don't remember the name. To, to Pinambas or something like that. So when he came back to, to Europe in, in, in Germany, he published his, his book, True History in 1557, if I remember correctly, in, in Marburg, in the Protestant context. So, you know, struck me the idea of uh, the, the, the printed image as immortal, because to some extent, I was thinking that this uh, chronicle, Staden, Staden Chronic, the importance of illustrate his book, because his book has more than 20 illustrations about these this, this people in, in Brazil. So came to my mind the idea of uh, this, this, uh, the images, you know, the, the anamorphic illustrations in, in Staden's book, and how we create an alterity, draw illustrations, and, and, and throw a Christian perspective, considering the other, and in this case, the other was the, the people in Brazil. So my, 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 my comment was, what do you think about the, the power of illustrations during the 16th century mm -hmm. to, to conform the alterity 
not in Europe, but in this case, considering people from Americas right. and the yep. importance of printed images in that context. This is one my, my comment or more than a question. I don't know if you have some idea. Edward or Susanna, I whatever. I think that's a, that's a, that's a fascinating um, point that you make. And it's one that I tried to bring to bear in a lot of my uh, teaching around print culture in the 16th century and the way that print culture creates that alterity. Um, I rely heavily in, in some of my um, thinking about that on the work of Rosemary San Juan Mm -hmm. um, who's written extensively on that very question and the and the, that encounter with the Tupinamba that you're describing, uh, who takes up that exact perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, um, constructing a whole uh, other people or world within uh, a print culture mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is is something that that, as I say, is a major topic in the field at this point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I couldn't distill a response to that. Something that fascinates me about that question is not simply the print, but its role in conversion within the new world and how um, uh, print is implicated in that process, as well as sort of creating this um, alterity within, this, within a sort of European imaginary as well. Mm -hmm. And um, that is something that a lot of the sort of 16th century uh, thinkers respond to uh, in word as well around that sort of du the duality of print in constructing that um, transatlantic uh, uh, movement um, and the distortion of vision across across the Atlantic as well. Um, so I think that's really, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's just, uh, I mean, one of the, some of this um, some of this group is uh, grounded in 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 talk that I do in um, Manchester University and uh, I think it was about two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we, um, Edward is teaching about global renaissance. And I came in and I did uh, on the Americas and how the Americas is, is perceived in the picturing of the Americas and, and so on. And the strangeness of, so that's a whole, we try to grapple with that also with the, uh, against the core periphery models of, European history. We try to engage that at the same time, uh, and that and hold that space there. Um, just uh, mostly personally, that's because I teach in those spaces. But I don't do this ordinarily. I teach in those those spaces. So those are quite interesting, and we really do need uh, to be thinking uh, today to bring it to the final point about this today. Um, we are uh, supposed to bring diversity into the curriculum, okay? We all know we're supposed to bring race into the curriculum, diversity into the curriculum. How are we gonna do it? Well, if we don't do it, I'm not quite sure how we're going to do it. So this is being argued intensely, you know, how do you, uh, I have a, a student, a black woman, a woman, how do I enter into the history of architecture? So this is where we really, have to be able to professionally be able to engage those kind of questions. How can we integrate diversity into the curriculum, making sense of it, not just pouring scorn on the past, but very much thinking about integrating diversity into, I personally just, my, my business is talking about uh, what does this all tell us about the roots and the humanities and the arts of transdisciplinarity that's a big field, you know, the roots of, of the very roots of transdisciplinarity. So I think that speaking to your, to your thing is a, a huge enterprise where the humanities can play a really important role. I think perhaps we should, uh, where, where people seem to be sort of scattering at this point, maybe we should, <laughs> Um, maybe we should um, thank all of our participants, including the one who is unfortunately no longer here. For thank you very, very much for having us. Interesting, thank you. stimulating um, 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 discussion and, pres and, and presentations. And um, hope that we can continue the discussion.
We uh, shall. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. very, very much. Thank you.